Welcome to Async Building Blocks, a streaming data drama in three acts, or as Nell referred to it in the last talk, async drama or something. So, I forgive you. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been at Rust Station since 2018. Uh, I'm also a member of the Nix documentation team, where I lead a working group. Uh, if you've seen the Nix docs, my apologies. Uh, I'm also an engineer at a company called Flox, which is building tooling on top of Nix so that you don't have to actually know Nix to benefit from it. But uh, enough about me. Today, I am just your humble narrator. Uh, this story is about a message named Mary. So uh, as I said, this is async building blocks, not async material science. So we're not gonna get into the weeds on any particular topic. Uh, there's an example application that goes along with this that's on GitHub, and there'll be a link to that at the very end. So we'll begin by setting the stage. This is the world in which our heroine, Mary the Message, lives. We have a collection of weather stations, uh, each publishing measurements to a message queue system called PubSub. Uh, the weather stations are publishing messages to a weather messages topic, uh, and this is a queue, and the messages that arrive there are stored in this queue in the order that they arrive in. Our weather application uh, then reads from this topic, this queue, uh, and publishes, processes that data and then publishes weather predictions to a weather predictions topic. Uh, I'm realizing you may not be able to see the boxes very, oh. Looks good over there. It's kind of weird on this screen. Just want to make sure everybody could see what I was talking about. So in order to make these predictions, the app needs a, uh, essentially a snapshot of the whole world, one message from each station, uh, all these messages produced from around the same time. So uh, getting this group of messages from around the same time will turn out to be kind of tricky. And before we discuss why, let's meet our main character. So a bunch of cool software talks all have art, often hand-drawn, uh, but that requires fine motor skills that I don't have. So uh, instead, since AI is taking over the world, I figured I would generate some art with Midjourney. So this is the prompt that I asked for, uh, and in my head, I'm picturing an envelope with basically a face on it, uh, and what I got instead was this. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, so uh, this changed the tenor of the talk as I was writing it. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. So uh, Mary was just created uh, with some weather data and instructed to report to Pablo PubSub, the administrator of our message queue system. So let's discuss some of the problems that Mary's going to encounter on her way to meet Pablo. So the first problem is publishing synchronization. So let's say that our weather stations are each producing messages at the same rate, say 100 milliseconds between each message. Uh, in an ideal world, they would all be publishing in lockstep. So message one from each station would all be published at the same time. Uh, in reality, uh, that's not actually possible, um, and even if they're doing their best to do so. And so what you look, get instead is something that looks like this. So as you can see, the uh, messages are still published at the same rate from each station, but they're all offset from one another. And so uh, one consequence of this is that uh, at the same time, it uh, goes from being an instant, or as best as we can to be an instant, to a window. And so another consequence of this is that it's kind of unclear where this window should lie. Should it be here or should it be here? So you see in station three, message one and two both kind of land on that window boundary. So uh, which of these two messages should count? That's kind of up to you. The next problem you run into is the fact that between the weather station and PubSub, there exists this pesky thing called the internet. So some messages will go from the weather station to the message queue system just fine, no complications there. Uh, other messages will get lost or uh, otherwise just need to be retransmitted, and you may end up with duplicate messages or just a missing message entirely. Uh, other messages might take a detour and arrive later than expected due to network congestion. And so all of this combines to come up to give you this problem of message ordering. And so this is what an ideal message order might look like. You have message one from stations one, two, and three, 
And then you have message two from stations one, two, and three. Uh, and so because of all these problems, what you actually get is something that looks like this. So it's all scrambled. Uh, you might have duplicate messages. And so what this means is that uh, if all you want is the next group of messages, uh, you can't just read the next in messages off of the queue because like I said here, they might be all scrambled together. So all this combines to make up the problem space that we're kind of exploring today. Uh, but first, let's introduce our next character, Pablo PubSub. Uh, so informed by my previous failure, I tried to be more specific this time. Uh, I even asked for it to be cute. Uh, and so in my head, I'm imagining a bunch of pneumatic tubes like you might see at the drive through at the pharmacy or the bank if you're old and still go to physical banks. Uh, so uh, what I got instead was this. So <laughs> uh, it, it was cuter, uh, but it was still kind of cutely horrifying. Uh, and so I took another few stabs at this, uh, and eventually I just said, I give up. This is Pablo PubSub. And so you can see, uh, it kind of gave me what I asked for. His horrifying face is made out of pneumatic tubes to some degree. Uh, he's got some pretty gnarly teeth. And then his eyes are also pointing in who knows what direction. So Mary, having traversed the internet and reaching uh, the message queue system, arrives at PubSub and makes her way to find Pablo. Pablo says, hey, what can I do for you? Mary says, I have some weather data to deliver. Where should I go? Pablo says, aha, you're looking for the weather application. I'll point you in the right direction. And if you get lost along the way, I'll just send another copy. Mary, looking a little confused, says, what do you mean if I get lost? And wait, what do you mean you'll send another copy? So Pablo says, you know, all kinds of stuff can happen on the mean streets of the internet. Uh, messages get lost or delayed all the time. So we keep copies around in case something happens and we need to uh, send another copy. And so at this point, Pablo vaguely gestures with one of his flailing pneumatic tube arms to a bunch of cloning chambers, at which point Mary has an existential crisis. How do I know that I'm the real me? Am I the original me? Are there more of me out there already? Uh, Pablo, seeing this spiral happening in real time, says, okay, time to go, and pushes her out the door. This brings us to act two which is the application. So let's start getting into the details of how we handle this problem. So here's a high level overview of the various components of our system. So we have these incoming messages that are all mixed together. Uh, and the first component is called the demuxer, demuxer meaning demultiplexer. Uh, its job is to take this mixed together stream and then take those or mixed together uh, sequence of incoming messages and organize it into some format that's more convenient for the rest of the system to handle. The next component is the grouper, which is going to take this more organized format and form a group of messages that all came from whatever the same time means in this context. So once you have those groups, it's going to go through the processor, which is going to do the prediction part, uh, as we mentioned earlier. And then the publisher will take those predictions and send them back off to PubSub. So let's discuss how we model our incoming messages. So in a synchronous world, you model a sequence of items with the iterator trait. And this has all kinds of nice combinators like take, skip while, and then that kind of thing. Uh, in the asynchronous world, you model this with a stream. And so my mental model for a stream is essentially an iterator that returns futures. And so the stream trait is actually the low level interface for this. And so you actually won't use it much yourself in practice. All of those nice combinators that I mentioned for the iterator trait are actually in a separate trait called stream X or stream extension. Uh, and that's where things like take, skip, while, and then all that stuff lives. Uh, and then there's another trait called async stream, which provides a couple of macros that allow you to write imperative code to create a stream yourself. It essentially provides a keyword yield that you hand an expression that will then become the next item from your stream. So message ordering. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have this problem where messages are going to be out of order, messages arrive late, and all I want is the next set of messages. What is the solution? We're going to buffer the messages, which brings us to Beatrix Buffer. So Mary arrives at the weather application 
and sees a woman keeping other messages in neatly ordered lines. Uh, she begins to approach, but before she can do so, somebody blows a whistle at her and runs over to her. But we'll get to that character in just a moment. So, mid-journey. I gave it a prompt, innocuous, seemingly. I wanted a woman with a clipboard and a, uh, a lanyard keeping people in lines ordered with like stanchions, which are those like seatbelt material looking things that keep you in line at the airport. And this is what I got. And the horror in this example is not as readily apparent. So I asked for stanchions, which is like I said, is a seatbelt looking material. What I got instead was a chain. Uh, <laughs> and not just any chain, but one that's not connected to anything in particular floating in midair, uh, except for maybe this man's belt and unfortunately, this man's crotch. <laughs> so, uh, buffers. We're going to model them essentially uh, as a hash map. And so we're going to order our messages along kind of two axes. One is the station that the messages came from, and the other is the message creation time. And so station one, all the way on the left, station in, all the way on the right. Earlier messages towards the top, later messages towards the bottom. So uh, the key on our hash map will be the uh, station number, and then the value is the actual buffer for that particular station. And so we're using a vec deck here rather than, say, a vector, because messages may arrive late and need to be inserted at the beginning of the line. And so doing that in a vector causes everything else to be shifted, and that's not terribly efficient. So a vec deck allows you to do that much more efficiently. Which brings us to Dino Demuxer. So you can see he's kind of a gym coach kind of character. Uh, you don't need to see the prompts anymore, just know that I gave it a solid try. Uh, so uh, I will point out that these children appear to be pleading rather than cheering. Uh, there's also a disembodied arm, and then this child, uh, apparently his lower body, is made entirely out of basketball-sized baseballs. So uh, Dino's job is to take a newly arrived message and bring it to the correct buffer for that station, and then Beatrix's job is to put that message in the correct order in line. And so, as I mentioned, Mary has just walked in the door, uh, and Dino blew a whistle at her and ran over to her. And he says, quick, which station did you come from? Mary, kind of surprised, says, uh, I don't know, station one? And Mary, uh, Dino says, over there, hustle, 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 because he's a gym coach and he's kind of like gruff. Uh, so. He hurries Mary over to the correct line as he walks into, or as he talks into a walkie-talkie, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, and of course, as he sends her over there, he sends her through an obstacle course because he's a gym coach and that builds character. So this message insertion process, just to see it visually, uh, looks like this. So Dino uh, has a new message uh, and he's going to bring it over to Beatrix, uh, which is at station one. Uh, the buffer for station one, and you can see that we have room in that buffer, so she's going to insert it in the correct position and live in, in line. Uh, the other thing that Beatrix does, uh, which we haven't discussed really, is she will also discard any duplicate messages as they arrive if it's already in the buffers. So uh, we're going to head off a uh, problem that we have not yet encountered, which is coordinating buffer access. So. Dino and Beatrix are responsible for putting messages into the buffers, and then in a moment, we're gonna meet a character, Greta Grouper, who will pull messages out of the buffers. And so we have a classic race condition here where you have some component putting stuff into the buffers and another component trying to pull stuff out. And so we're Rust developers. Uh, we have principles and compiler-enforced moral superiority. So we're not out here raw dogging mutable pointers, or letting the quantum fluctuations of the universe determine winners and losers, we're going to use a mutex. So, uh, Mitch Mutex, as you can see, is this referee kind of character, and Midjourney has helpfully taken the stripes from his uniform and applied them to his face. Sure, why not? Uh, AI is the future. Uh, so, at application startup, Mitch Mutex will take a walkie-talkie uh, with a strip of tape on it, written the letters A-R-C for ARC, uh, and he's gonna hand one of these walkie-talkies to both Dino and to Greta Grouper. And so anybody that wants to access the buffers will need to okay it with him first by speaking into the walkie-talkie. And this is what Dino was doing earlier. So you can imagine that at some point, 
there might be an influx of messages, and Dino will start spamming the walkie-talkie, saying, I have a new message, I have a new message, I have a new message, at which point, Mitch will blow the whistle and say, given the mutex of business, task is blocked until further notice, it's not your turn, Dino, chill out. So, we have our messages, uh, or our buffers behind these, this arc mutex uh, combination, and so there's one thing to point out here, which is that there's actually a mutex both in the standard library and in Tokyo. And so the question is, which one should you use? And so there are magic words in this kind of situation. Uh, and if you know them, say them along with me. It depends. Uh, so uh, if you know the words, congratulations. You're a senior engineer. Uh, enjoy your raise. Um, so uh, let's look. We've talked about some components of our system in detail, so let's look at the picture of the system in more detail. Um, so this is the component that we've just discussed. So we have the input stream coming into the demuxer, and then the demuxer and this grouper, which we'll discuss in a moment, uh, both refer to the buffers through arc, uh, and the buffers are protected by this mutex. This brings us to the next kind of aspect of our system, which is parallel execution. So uh, we want to be able to run different components of our system independently, uh, and Futures can execute concurrently on a single thread, that's kind of the whole point, uh, but sometimes you still want them to execute at the same time. And so if you have a multi-threaded runtime like Tokyo, you can take those futures, schedule them as tasks, and it will run them on separate threads at the same time. And so the way this works kind of mechanically is that for each of our components, we'll create a future. And we'll take that future and hand it to the Tokyo spawn function which will turn that into a task, which then floats off into the ether of our runtime to do whatever the runtime does, uh, and you get back a handle to that task, which you can then await or cancel or whatever. Uh, and so once we've done that for all of the components of our system, we'll then await all of them at the same time using the futures select macro. And so like I said, we're not going into super detail here. There's an example application that will be provided at the very end if you want to see this in more detail. So, we can finally get to the problem of grouping the messages. Uh, and so like I said, the prediction algorithm wants a snapshot of the entire world. Uh, and so we need messages from around the same time. And so there's actually a lot of tricky details here. Uh, for instance, uh, how long do you wait for late arrivals? So if you just want every message, uh, you just wait for an infinite period of time. Uh, if you have latency requirements, you obviously can't do that. Uh, we also have this problem, like I discussed earlier, of what does same time mean? You have some window, which messages can fall into that window, how do you handle that situation, yada, yada, yada. So a large part of my last job was doing this exact problem, so I can tell you from experience, you can do a whole talk on just that alone. So we're going, for the sake of this talk, we're just gonna say every time we want a group of messages, we'll just wait for some period of time, and once that timer ends, we'll just grab the oldest messages that are in the buffers. And so, let's discuss what that looks like visually, just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So, these are what our buffers look like. First thing we do is we're going to wait. And so while we're waiting, Dino and Beatrix are hard at work stuffing things into the buffers. And so, we're going to keep waiting, and at some point, the timer will run out, at which point, we get to do our job, which is just to pull out those oldest messages from the buffers to form a group. So, mid-journey, uh, what I asked for, and you'll see why in a moment, is a woman catapulting uh, people into a portal on the wall. <laughs> and what I got was a red-headed version of the girl from the ring uh, sitting on a catapult that's floating in midair as if it were a swing set. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Mary has been in line for a moment, so uh, initially she was inserted somewhere in line, uh, and she waits for a while, and eventually she becomes the first person in line for whatever station she came from. Uh, so Greta approaches the group of messages, uh, the messages that are all waiting in line, and tries to uh, pull the first person from li each line out, asks them to stand in a group on a certain spot on the floor, marked out in tape. At some point, uh, she asks them to stand there for a moment, and so she backs away, 
uh, walks over to the wall and then punches a button that nobody else saw there because she has special knowledge. Uh, at which point, a robotic arm descends from the ceiling, wrapping the messages in plastic wrap into a nice little package. Uh, and the floor flips up, catapulting the messages off into a blue portal on the wall. Sick. So uh, let's discuss what this portal is all about. So uh, how do you get data out of tasks? So when you call a function, you get a value back. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, a task, like I said, you create it with Tokyo Spawn, and it kind of floats off into the ether of your runtime. Uh, so a task itself has a return value, but you only get that back once the uh, task has completed. And so if we want our system to run forever and continually get data out of it, that's obviously not going to work. So how do you get data out of tasks? So one option is to write to an external data structure. Uh, this is what we're doing with the demuxer. Uh, it's running, and as it's running, it's constantly storing data in those buffers. Uh, another option is to use channels. And so uh, behind the scenes, it's doing the same thing. Uh, but really, uh, you can think about a channel as basically a computer wormhole where you get two ends when you create a channel. One is the end that you shovel things into, at which point it disappears and you no longer have to care about it. Uh, and the other end is something that just data lands in your lap, and now that you have data, you can do something with it, and you don't have to care about where it came from. So this is good for being able to get data out of tasks or data between tasks, but it's also nice from kind of an architectural standpoint because it allows you to decouple which components of your system have to care about what. So back to our granular view of the system, we just discussed this part, so the grouper uses the arc to reference the buffers and get data out of it, makes a group, and then sends data off through a channel to the next component. Which brings us to act three, uh, metamorphosis. Uh, so things are about to get weird for Mary and her cohort of messages. The component of the system we're about to talk about is right here, the processor. And so this will take two channels, uh, one that it will read messages, uh, read groups of messages from, and then it's gonna do its job and then put the uh, resulting prediction onto the next channel. And so uh, that's pretty much exactly what's going on here. Take a group of messages, you run it through some algorithm. I'm not gonna go into the details of the algorithm because like all algorithms, it's magic. Um, you get a prediction out and that goes onto another channel. Uh, which brings us to the processor. And so this one just came out dope and not horrifying. So let's all just give Midjourney a round of applause for a little bit of a palate cleanser. Well done, Midjourney. So uh, the shrink-wrapped group of messages is ejected unceremoniously from the other end of the portal, landing at the feet of the entity known as the processor. Uh, it sits on a throne made out of technology with a book in its lap with gold embossed letters on the spine reading the algorithm. So uh, the processor greets the group of messages saying, hello, I'm sure your journey here has been strange and perilous. However, nothing will have prepared you for the choice that I now lay before you. If you consent, you will ascend to a higher state of being, a prediction. You will cease to exist individually, but the application will fulfill its purpose, and the future weather will be known. What say you? Uh, Mary, looking a little confused, says, you know, can't we just kind of like tell you what our data says? Do we need to do all that stuff? Uh, and so the, predict the uh, processor, uh, very sternly looks at her and says, sure, but that would be decidedly less rad. So uh, Mary, looking at the other messages, uh, says, you know, he has a point that would be a lot less rad. Uh, so they all nod at each other, indicating their consent, at which point the processor presses a button on his throne. Uh, a beam of light cascades down from the ceiling uh, onto the messages and they meld into a single glowing orb of light known as a prediction. A door opens on the other side of the room, revealing another portal, and the orb floats through the portal. So, mid-journey. This is the prompt. A glowing ball of light with several faces. This could only go well. It did not go well. <laughs> uh, so for those of you that don't know, Midjourney gives you four examples for every prompt that you give it, 
And in this case, three out of the four appear to be some form of jack-o'-lantern. Uh, and the one on the top left is just some big chonky boy. Uh, so uh, they're all equally terrifying. Pick your favorite and let's move on. So this brings us to our final component, which is Padma Publisher. So the floating orb of light exits the door and finds itself at a loading dock. Uh, there's a woman smiling and holding a brown paper bag. Uh, the orb floats over to her and Padma introduces herself, you know, hello, I'm Padma, uh, and my, aren't you a sight to behold? And the prediction, uh, having its sense of humor removed by the process of turning it into a hive mind, says, I can't tell there are no mirrors. Padma says, uh, well, okay, you're going to head back to Pablo now, so why don't you take this with you for the trip? Uh, Padma opens this brown paper bag, and the prediction floats over and peers inside, seeing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and some orange slices. Thanks, Padma. Uh, <laughs> uh, prediction says, uh, we have ascended to a higher state of being and no longer require food to sustain our physical form. Uh, at which point Padma replies, I know, it just makes me feel useful. Off you go. And so the prediction floats into the back of Padma's truck and they take off into the void of the internet. So this component is relatively simple because usually if you're interacting with some kind of message queue system, there's some kind of library that uh, handles the I.O. for you, either the reading uh, from the message queue or writing to the message queue. And so here, uh, you can actually just turn a, uh, a channel into another stream if you're using the futures channels. And so there's not a whole lot to show you here. Um, so uh, with regards to mid-journey, I'll point out two things. Uh, one, the windshield is somehow behind Padma. Uh, let's not think about that too hard. Uh, the second is that we have incontrovertible proof that Padma is a wizard because her left hand is not connected to anything in particular, meaning that she knows the mage hand spell for all my D&D friends out there. So having ascended to a higher state of being, prediction can now see the fabric of reality and can see all the tasks executing in parallel. They float through the internet, unbothered by all of the perils of network congestion misconfigured servers, and nefarious BGP hijacking incidents. Uh, prediction arrives back at the message processing facility, making their way back to Pablo, uh, at which point it says, Pablo, we have traversed the internet and survived. We are ready for what comes next. Pablo says, well, uh, US East 1 is down for the moment, so I guess you'll have to stick around me, stick around with me for a while. And so a face made out of pneumatic tubes embedded in a wall and a hive mind inhabiting a floating orb of light, truly a friendship meant for the ages. But that, my friends, is a story for another day, bringing us to the end of this one. So I appreciate your attention, and I hope you had fun. So uh, there's a few places you can find me. Uh, and like I said, the code is uh, available on GitHub. I'm not sure if it's public yet. Um, but I will make it public after the talk. Uh, and the slides will also be available on GitHub as well. So. Thank you for your attention.